opportunity in a free country to be able to come before you and lift up your name, to worship you, to bow down before you as our God and our King. God, we just ask that you would meet us today. As we draw near to you, you said that you would draw near to us, and that's what we look for, Father, that we would commune with you, and you would be our God, and we would be your people. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. With a melody, and you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears have gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I believe, I believe in from my mother's womb, from my mother's womb. You have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again into a family. Your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer No longer a slave to fear. 
thank you that Father you desire to and you already have poured out on us and Lord we want to honor you in this this moment and this, this ordinance that you have given your church to do this in remembrance of you and Father as we prepare for this moment I pray that Father you speak to our hearts if there be anything that's standing in the way this morning between you and us that Father we confess it and make it right we bless you in Jesus name Come and take the elements and we'll take it together, okay?
to read you a passage this morning. In Ephesians chapter 1, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ and to himself according to the kind intention of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved when Christ willingly went to the cross and bought our salvation with his sacrifice we were adopted we were taken in and we were get brought to God through the very body of the Lord through his brokenness, through the sacrifice that he made. So when he said, do this in remembrance of him, we are remembering the sacrifice that brought us redemption. Man, let's pray. Fathers, we take this, this bread. We remember the sacrifice that you made so that we could be redeemed, so that we could be adopted into your family. And we could be restored to a relationship that was intended from the beginning. And we bless you. We take this in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name, amen. And then it says this. In him, Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Jesus' blood forgave our sin. And there's nothing, there's no sin that we could commit that's not forgivable. Now don't go to the unpardonable. We're not talking about that. Okay? But everything that we commit is covered in the blood of Jesus is forgivable. And today, if you're thinking that there's something that, man, I've got, just gotten so bad, God can't forgive this. I'm here to tell you in great love, you're wrong. Your sin is forgiven. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins. Why? Because of the blood. Because of the blood. Oh, the blood of Jesus that washed away my sin. Father, we remember the sacrifice you made. Lord, as I lift this cup, I lift it to you, thanking you and thankfulness that we are forgiven and that our sin has been washed away. And when we do sin, we can confess it to you. And because of the blood that was shed on Calvary, it's forgiven. So Lord, we remember and we give you thanks in Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship.
Break our walls down, Spirit, break out, heaven come I have two things I'd like to share with you today. First, this is the last Sunday that we're taking donations for the Thanksgiving boxes for the families that we'll be giving out right before Thanksgiving. If you remember, it's a cost of $32. In the uh, bulletin you were given when you walked into the front door, there should be a giving envelope in there. If you would like to make a donation today, if you would put it in that envelope and drop it in the offering, that would be great. Uh, we can also uh, do it by uh, the giving kiosk in the back if you'd like to do that manner of payment also. Second, one morning last week, I just flipped my Bible open and there was Hebrews 13 before me and I read it and I knew then that I needed to share it today. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid what can mere mortals do to me? Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share it with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Let us continue our offering or our worship with our offering. If you're unable to give today, please offer God a prayer of thanksgiving and praise. If you'd like to give with a card, there's a giving kiosk in the back corner to my right. If you're watching us via Ustream or if you're unable to come on a Sunday, please consider using the Marietta Vineyard app. And if this isn't your home church, please hold your offering for your home church. I feel like God giving me a picture I'm going to share real quick. And when I was looking around the room, it's just so neat to, when we worship, to look around the room and look what other people are doing. And He encourages you to watch other people worship. And when I looked around the room, I just was overwhelmed with the stories in these chairs. Everybody has a story. And God gave me this picture of water going through dry land. And there was like these little trickles every one of our lives was a stream and it felt like they weren't making a difference and I felt like the Lord just zoomed me out and just saw this aerial picture of all these streams coming together and making a huge difference I mean we're making a difference y'all so I just wanted to, the Lord sees that and he wants us to know it amen so Lord if the ushers, ushers will come forward we're going to pray Father, I thank you for this place.
and these friends, brothers and sisters, for whatever season we're in and will be in and have been in, you call us to walk together, arm in arm, doing battle with, for each other. Do make a difference and you are the spirit that drives us it's your spirit as we sang this morning that you pour into us and today we give back to you because you're worth it and you multiply it Lord would you bless every family in this room every family represented in this room every family that's prayed for every heart that prays for people, family members, friends, Lord, you hear it all. I pray that your power would go out from our hearts into those lives, that we would see fruit, that you would multiply that, and that lives would be rescued, and the lost would be saved, and that the, the body of Christ would welcome them and we would say, come, come as you are. We will love you as you are. And we will see God change you. What an honor. What is worth life but to do that, to change lives? What is there? Nothing, Lord, but you. I will waste my life serving you. because nothing else is worth it. It's rags. Amen.
Thanksgiving boxes, you guys are not going to believe we have so many that we're going to be able to give out this year. And it's really exciting. We should have a, a pretty close number by the end of the service today. We, now we have more boxes than we have families. This is a problem. This is a good problem to have. Um, if you know of a family that could benefit from this, um, that things are tight, please email me, cbartholic at hotmail.com, or call me or come see me because now... We really do need more families. We only have about 25 from last year. So please come see me about that. We're going to need volunteers on Saturday, November 19th. We're going to need about 20 drivers to deliver the boxes. Is there anybody right now that knows that they can do that? Raise your hand. Drivers? We've got to have a lot more drivers than that. So that's something to pray about. Um, on the connections table is um, a sign-up sheet for drivers and volunteers. Um, I believe that's it. Just keep that in your prayers. It's going to be the Saturday before Thanksgiving, and um, we'll be giving out more information next week. Thank you. And now, please welcome Pastor Ron. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. A couple of quick things. If you guys, I really encourage you, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, which means I'm begging, okay? Then on the Thanksgiving uh, boxes, the baskets that we're giving out, if you could take a Saturday and come here and deliver two boxes, you know, just two, it would really help because it's a blessing. And, you know, bring somebody with you, go as a pair, go as a, you know, as a team. And because every year that we've done this, it has been a blessing. 
And sometimes we've gone there and there was, you know, the people weren't there anymore or something like that. So guess what? You take the basket and you drive along till you see somebody, stop and go, God bless you. And then they freak out and they call the police. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I got to do that on a couple of the, we had bags last year. And I gave out bags because the people weren't at the home, that place anymore. And so there was no way I was going to leave, just leave it on the doorstep with nobody. So I drove around till I found somebody. And I just said, here, this is from God, from Marietta Vineyard Church. God bless you. I prayed with them and left, and they're standing there going. As people cry because there's some people that are really hurting. So if you know of anybody in your neighborhood, there's somebody, like Christina said, is, is, is tight financially, let us know. And we'll bring them a box. And it, it, it's a complete meal in a box. So it's wonderful, okay? So that on that Saturday, let's see if we can get everybody out. You know, it's a Saturday before Thanksgiving, so you're not going to be really cooking or anything yet. So let's see if we can get some people out and deliver a couple of boxes. It's going to be a blessing. Second thing, we've been praying for quite a while as, as a church, and, um, and the elders have been doing this, and also the leadership, about our worship ministry. You know, where we want to go now. Kelly's been doing a wonderful job leading. I've been leading. We've had Christina lead. We've had Laura lead. And, but there's been hasn't been anybody that's been leading the teams and we've been praying and praying and seeking the Lord over it and God opened the door because he brought us a family that said listen we want to just volunteer and, and be the worship pastor here and so we prayed about it even more about another six months we prayed and then the Lord gave us clarity it's time so Gerald and Wendy why don't you come on up <laughs> well, that's taken care of, isn't it? That's good. <laughs> I'm going to ask the elders if they would to come up also, because in Acts chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas were in with the elders and leaders of prophets, you know, many of the, the believers in Antioch, and they were praying, and the Lord made it clear that Paul and Barnabas were supposed to, they had a mission that they had to go do. And the group there understood that. They prayed, they fasted, and then he laid hands on them, and they sent them out to do it. So that's what we're going to do today. So I'm going to ask if you all, if you would stand real quick. If you would reach your hands out, we're going to pray over them, and we're going to bless them and set them apart to be the worship pastor here at this church, okay? So just take a minute and let's pray for them. Ask God to bless them. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the gift that you gave us and Gerald and Wendy. We thank you that Gerald has that call on him, and so does Wendy, to lead your people in worship. And Father, in Jesus' name, as a church, as elders in the church, we lay hands on Gerald and Wendy, and we set them apart for this ministry. And we give you thanks that you gave them to us as a gift, and we receive them as a gift. We ask that, Lord, you would grant them wisdom as they lead in worship and as they train up and raise up musicians and singers, dancers, artists, whatever you desire that will bring you honor and glory, we want to happen here. And we ask for wisdom to know your times and your seasons for each and everything. And, Lord, again, we bless Gerald. And bless Wendy. We bless their family. We pray protection over them as they step into this, this area of warfare. And Lord, we pray protection and we plead the blood of Jesus over their family. That you will cover them and protect them. We pray for health and blessings and prosperity over their family in every way. And we thank you for them. Again, we thank you for them. And we honor them today. And we set them apart to do your work in this fellowship here. 
And in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. Give the Lord a praise offering on it. Yay! <laughs> all right, children, guess what? It's your time. Chillins, be free. Be free. Go to your class. And the rest of us will stand up and walk on one another for a moment. Alrighty, alrighty, let's. We just got a news flash, breaking news, that we just counted how many possible baskets we have, and right now the count is over 60 boxes. What a blessing. I'm, tell, I'm telling you, if you guys don't miss out on that Saturday of coming and driving and taking a couple of boxes, I'm telling you, it, you it, we're, we're singing spirit break out. Let me tell you something. It will happen. It will happen when you're praying for people and you're dropping these off and, and seeing their faces and how, how it blesses them. So please, 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 please come. Please come. This is how we're praying, and then we're going to dig into God's word this morning for a few minutes. Lord, thank you that you've given us your word. You said in your, in your word in Psalm 119 that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. You even told us in that same psalm to hide your word in our hearts that we might not sin against you. It says in that same psalm that, Lord, your word grants us wisdom. And it's a very standard for our lives. And we ask now as we look into your word that, Lord, it will come, you, will, you will illumine us with it. You will enlighten us with it. You will grant us a spirit of wisdom and revelation as we look into your word. And we bless you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You can't tell what I'm preaching on, can you? Don't panic. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for today, okay? I'm not going to sit here and compare the two candidates in any way, shape, or form. I'm not going to tell you one's better than the other. But I will say this. You see these little voter guides? I encourage you to get one. They're not in your bulletin. They're on the connections table. Grab one. And I will say this one thing about voting, and then we're going to move into a different area of this that this is the standard by which we vote. It's simple. We're making it difficult when it's not. This is the standard that we vote with. If the issue or the, the issues in some ways don't match up to the word of God, then don't vote for that. But I'll tell you this, vote. I still got my little sticker. Where's that, that one? Where is it? Because I believe in voting. I think if we don't vote, it's as much a sin as anything else. You know why? 
you're going, wait a minute, man, you got really, you, you took a path there. Because of this, what we will do if we don't vote, we sit and we will gripe about what happens. And the Bible says that grumbling is a sin. So therefore, get my point? Because you're saying, so you're saying if you don't vote, it's a sin? No, if you don't vote, you will sin. You know why? You're going to gripe. And you're going to grumble. And you're going to complain. And I'm going to show you something in the Word of God that you will probably do that is as much a sin as anything else. Let me show you the next slide. The state of the union in most cases reflects the state of the church. You're going, how can you say that? Let me show you something. What's going on in our nation right now? Fear, confusion, anger, hate. What was it last, what was it yesterday? There was a possible assassination attempt against Donald Trump. We tend, the church, unfortunately, will tend to mirror the world, which is wrong. I've seen on Facebook, ugh, I've seen on Facebook, I've seen in papers, I've, I've heard people in, in stores, grocery stores, you know, Bible bookstores, going off in anger about the elections, about what's going on. If you say, well, I'm for Trump or I'm for Clinton, it just starts a battle. But the Bible tells us that that is not how believers are supposed to act. But then we justify it by this, by saying, well, the, the, our, our country is in danger. Well, yeah, our country's in a lot of, it's been in danger for many, many, many years. Our country was started in rebellion. Not saying it was right, not saying it was wrong, but let's face a fact. Our country was rebelling against England, didn't we? Mm. You don't see that in the history books. <laughs> so we've been in trouble for a long time. But here's my point, is that if we are, as believers will do what God tells us in his word, it will calm our hearts, it will give us wisdom, it will give us understanding about how we need to walk as believers during this election and during the outcome of the, re the election. I believe the pastors need to be talking about this stuff. Am I afraid of the Johnson Act, which is, you know, Lyndon Johnson's act against the churches, that if we say anything or endorse a political, uh, you know, person, that we can lose our 501c3? Come and take it. Am I endorsing anybody? No. But I'm not going to be walking in fear. Because is this an important time in our, in our nation? Absolutely. I believe it's more important than any other election that we've pretty much faced since our, our nation was birthed. Because things are hanging in here that have been set up to be that way for many, many years. Look at the last 25 years. Where have we gone? For those of us that can remember that we're voting 25 and 30 years ago, look what's gone on. We're in a, are we in a crisis point? Yes. But is there any reason to fear? No. Let me show you something. How should we respond? What if our candidate doesn't win? Are we going to blow something up and loot? How should we, believers respond? We should respond this way, as true Christ-like believers. Turn with me. Here we go. First Peter. A book written by the king of attitude, Peter. Peter was always getting in trouble. Look at something. First Peter, chapter 2. Let's look at verse 13. Here we go. This is going to really get us all mad. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him. Now stop there.
as sent by who? Him. Let's keep going. This really stirred up. For the punishment, sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. On Facebook. <laughs> Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Did that make you cringe? How many of us have griped about Obama? How many of us have repented for griping of Obama? Because he is a king. <laughs> no sarcasm. But he is the leader of our nation. And according to this, if we just take it literally, it says to honor him. Whether we like it or not. Let me show you a couple things. We are a people who honor. If we're believers, we're a people who honor. It doesn't matter who the person is, we honor them. It says honor. What does honor mean? Honor means to esteem. It means to honor. It means to, rev to revere or, bring, or have reverence for. Here's the, the literal meaning of it. It means to fix a price upon, but it means to fix a price upon as good. So when I, we honored Gerald a few minutes ago, we, fixed it, we, we, we set a price upon Gerald and Wendy that they are good, that they are called here. So when God opens the door, whether we think the elections are rigged or whatever, no, it doesn't matter. Whoever gets in that spot, according to this word, we are to honor them. Period. Now what does that mean? We're going to get to that. We honor in submitting. This not only honors the person, but also honors the position of authority. To submit, look what it says. Look at verse 13. Submit, the first word, yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors, as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. Now, the word submit is the exact same word that's used in Ephesians when it says for wives to submit to husbands. And just the verse above that, it says to submit ourselves to one another. Exact same word. It's the word hupotasso, which means this. It means to rank oneself under, which is not what our nation started out as. And then we wonder why this goes on. We are called, no matter what, to bosses, whether we like them or not, whether we agree with them or not, to submit. Now you're going, man, you're pushing the line here, man. You're really pushing the line. Well, we're going to get to the line in a second. But we are called to submit, to honor. And that way of honoring is that of submission. That means we don't gripe about it. That means we don't rebel against it unless it blatantly goes against us in this way. When did Christians ever rebel in the Bible? Many places. But when did they really stand against the government and said, I can't do that? When they were being persecuted for righteousness sake, for the kingdom, for sharing the gospel. Other than that, they submitted to the authority. Do you know when, well, I don't want to jump too far ahead. Because see, I could do this without the notes, but I want to bring some points up. In Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, we don't have to turn. Well, let's turn to it. Let's just do it. Let's read it. Let's get it down here. Titus chapter 2. Ch excuse me, Titus chapter 3. I'm sorry. Chapter 3. Paul is telling Titus, who was in a place called Crete, <laughs> which was a very rebellious place. He says this to, to Titus to remind the Christian believers. Look what he says. Remind them, chapter 3 of Titus, right after 2 Timothy, right before Philemon. Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Remind them, who? The believers. 
to be subject to rulers. There's that word. Same word. Subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. Now let's stop there for a second. Let me tell you something. He said be subject, which is the same word, hupotasso, which means to rank oneself under. And it says and not to malign. This means this. The word malign means to hurt the reputation or smite with reports or words of evil or to slander or to rail at. That's scary. What has been going on in our nation? What have believers been doing? What, how have we been reacting to those candidates that could, one of them is going to be our next president? I, I'm going to say, what if Hillary wins? What is, what, what is the church going to do? It's going to be split. And there's going to be those that don't want Hillary. What if Donald Trump wins? Remember, he hates women. That's what people are saying. And look at Hillary. What are they saying about her? Either way, if we start railing at them or railing at this and saying, oh, well, I can't believe it. You know, God's going to judge our nation because of Hillary she's got in there or because of Trump. And he's going to, I can't say, I will not submit. I'm moving out of America. Go, see, there it goes. Bye. That's what we would want to do, right? <laughs> There's the Canada. Right? What would we want to do? But that is not the response that God's word demands of believers. We are never to malign, meaning what? We don't smite the reputation of them. We don't, with words or reports or anything, we don't speak evil of them. We don't slander them and we don't rail at them. Because it says, look what it says to malign no one. And then it tells us to be peaceful, to be gentle, showing every consideration for all men, even if we don't agree with it. That's what God's word says. I Believe me, as I was preparing this this week, I was repenting. At my desk, it almost turned into wailing and gnashing of teeth. I'm not kidding you. In fact, Rick walked into my office and he goes, be happy. I didn't tell him at that moment when he walked in, but I'm telling him now, when he walked into my office, I was studying this because I've been in there pretty much most of the day. You know, I just came out to, you know, yeah, and then I would go back. And he walked in, and I was deep into this, and I was going, oh, my gosh. Lord, I was going, Lord, forgive me. What have I said about Obama over the years, over the last eight years? What have I said? What did I say about Clinton? You're saying you didn't like those guys. No. But I wasn't honoring him. I can like not like their position. I can even not like them as a person and still honor them. And I and God was speaking in my heart. You didn't you haven't been honoring them. You said some mean things about that guy, about your president. And so there were times I had to repent because why? That word malign was speaking to me. Why do we do this? Turn back to 1 Peter. Or turn forward to 1 Peter, actually. Why do we do this? Look at this. Chapter 2 again, verse 13. Submit yourselves for the what? The Lord's sake. Literally, it means this. Submit yourselves because of the Lord. That's a literal translation of it. We would use the Lord's sake, but literally it means because of the Lord. That's the reason. Why? Because this. He asked us to, and he demanded it of us. He's God. Once, he once subjected, he once was subjected to earthly rulers himself. Why? through having all things subject to him. God himself sent his son, Philippians chapter 2, and he says he became obedient. Jesus himself, the son of God, subjected himself to the leaders and rulers in Jerusalem at that time. Wow. 
to the point where even as he knew that they were going to crucify him, even when he was standing there, he even looked at the, when the, when the uh, guards came to get him, what did he say? I can call a thousand angels, a legion of angels right now, but that's not the will of the Father. He was standing before Pilate, and what happened? He never once railed at Pilate. He never once railed at the Sanhedrin. He never once railed at Herod. It says he stood there as a lamb being led to slaughter. You're going, but that's not what we're supposed to do. we got to stand. No. And I'm going to show you why. I'm going to show you why this morning. Peter wrote this. Look, look at 1 Peter there. Just look at the page there. Now think about this. Peter wrote this while under the rule of Emperor Nero Augustus Caesar. One of the nastiest emperors that, from what I understand, had ever hit Rome. He hated Christians. In fact, he burned Rome and blamed the Christians so the persecution could increase. That's a historical fact. And Peter wrote this Paul wrote these things during the reign of Nero. And during that reign, persecution was raging against believers. It was Nero that put, put uh, uh, Peter to, to death, upside down. Well, he, he asked to be upside down, from what we understand, on a cross. It put him to death. And he's telling the believers, no matter what they're persecuting, if they're persecuting you, still honor them. Man! How can you believe, how can we even face that? What, what, how can we do that? By the presence of God in our lives. We, how we respond shows forth whether we carry the presence of God or not. I'm sorry. There's no way around this. Look at verse 16. It says, act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Let's start from the beginning, verse 13. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution. The word every in the Greek means? Exactly. Whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him, which tells us where they come from, for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Let me tell you something. Stop there before we get to the next verse. If we start acting as believers, when people start going off about it, by our reaction of not reacting and of speaking honor, we will silence those that are trying to do evil. I've had people go, who are you going to vote for? Now, my dad taught me this, none of your business because it's a private thing. But I've told them. And some people have not liked it. You're going to vote for so-and-so? Yeah. Well, how can you do that? Look at what they're doing. Look at what they're going to bring. Well, okay, yeah, I know. But look at what they are bringing. But as I sat there and just quietly listened, the tone went from here, and they go, is this do you understand what I'm saying? I say, I understand perfectly, but this is what the Bible says. i got to honor these guys. Oh, well, you can, but I'm not. And I've had people walk away. But it silences. Because why? Our behavior is supposed to be so counter what the world is that it's so different. This is what it, the, the idea behind it. It makes them speechless. It's like, you know that, <laughs> you know, asthmatic? <laughs> and they, it, because why? They, it, it, it blows people's minds when we try to do what God's asked us to do, when we walk according to his word. It catches people off guard. Now, not everybody, I'm, I'm generalizing. There's some who are going to go off and go bananas over it. But that's okay because this is what God's word says. This is how we're supposed to act. We're supposed to act as what? As free men. Meaning what? We're not to use our freedom. Remember, we've been talking about freedom for how long now? For weeks upon weeks, talking about the freedom in Christ. We are free. 
We are completely free not to just do whatever we want to. We have freely given ourselves to the service and to the leadership of God in our life through the Holy Spirit. And in that, we are free from sin. We're free from, from the bondage of sin in our life. We're free from the punishment of sin. But sin still reigns. But we don't have to submit to that anymore. We have to submit to that. And in our freedom, we can choose to vote for whoever we want to. We can eat whatever we want to. But it doesn't mean it's beneficial, as Paul said. We can drink, but it doesn't mean it's beneficial. But we're free. And he's saying, look what he says here again. As free men, do not use your freedom as a covering for evil. Meaning what? Meaning I'm free, I can say anything I want to, but it doesn't mean I'm going to do it. How about this? Well, I'm allowed, I'm allowed to do that. How many of your kids ever said that to you? How many of other people said it? I'm allowed to, don't judge me. I'm allowed to do this. I can do whatever I want. I'm free. Well, yeah, we can do whatever we, whatever we want. But it doesn't mean it's going to be right. He's saying don't use your freedom as a covering for evil. I can say what I want. You can. You're absolutely right. You can say what you want. But it doesn't mean it's according to the word of God. It doesn't mean it's in obedience to Christ. We, I, I am calling us as Marietta Vineyard Church to be the standard when it comes to this. Walking in freedom, but walking in obedience to God's word and being a standard when people are... Let me tell you, Tuesday's going to be a zoo. It's going to be wild. We don't know what's going to happen on Tuesday night or Wednesday morning. And I'm going to show you what we can do about that. Look what he says, and we're going to move on quickly. As free men, do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. Right after Philippians. Colossians chapter 1. Actually, Colossians chapter 3. I saw verse 1 we're going to start in. Look what it says. Watch this. Want to talk about freemen and bond slaves? Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, verse 1, or it actually means, therefore, since you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that, that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, watch this, consider or reckon the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside. Watch this. This is what we got to put aside. Anger, wrath, here's that word against, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. That's not, we're not supposed to live like that. Does that sound like the election and responses to the election? I'll answer, yes, it does. We're supposed to honor the outcome. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 4. Am I making sense this morning? Okay. Revelation chapter 4. Before you read it, just turn to it. Let me explain something to you. Tuesday night. We're going to watch the, every one of us will probably be watching the news. Let's get real. Most of us will be watching the news. And most of us will be eating dinner in front of the TV. Okay? Or at least close by where you can hear what's going on. You're going to want to see who's winning, what state goes red, what state goes blue, what state goes crazy. Okay? There's going to be all kinds of stuff on there. We're going to be watching it. And we're going to be listening to it. And if we can't, we're going to be on our phones trying to find out what's going on. Okay? Let's get real. 
as we see one go above the other, no matter who you're voting for or who you're voting for is losing, you're going to go, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. There's going to be all kinds of reactions. And the thing the enemy is doing is creating a fear. Why? Because in fear we get chaos. In chaos we get lawlessness. And in lawlessness, anything goes. And we're getting scared. There's no reason to be scared. We have a Christian cliche which has become that, but it is a truth. You know what it is? What did we just say a little while ago? What did Randy say? God's still on the throne. But here's the deal. You know, we're always saying, yo, let's get real. Nothing worse than a white man in a jacket doing that. <laughs> hey, thank you, thank you. <laughs> but let's get real. There's going to be disappointment. There could be. There could be all kinds of things that are happening. But the reality is this, is that according to what we just read in Colossians, we don't have to walk this way. Because the reality of this is, do we believe that God is on the throne? Do we believe that he is still in control? Do we believe that God can orchestrate his purpose and his will on this earth? Do we believe that he is Lord of our life? Do we believe that he is Lord in our lives? Let me show you something. Revelation chapter 4. Let's look at this. Ch chapter 4, verse 1. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what, you must, what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he, was sitting, and, and he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardis in, in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an, uh, like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and around the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds of, uh, of peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, and the second creature like a calf. And the third creature had a face like that of a man. And the fourth creature was like an e flying eagle. And the four living creatures, e each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night, they do not cease to say, not sing, say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him, who sits on the throne to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, O Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and because of your will they exist and were created. Now let me ask you a question. Oh, let me make a statement. That's God's office. Now think about that. We're always worried, who's going to be in the Oval Office? There's an office that's way above that one, that God is on the throne. And that's what we've got to understand. He is on the throne forever. And if he's on the throne forever, and he's in charge and he's the one that is moving and shaking the earth. He's the one that, that, that controls our lives. He's the one that we submitted to. He's the one who's the Lord, and we're the servants. He's the one who sets the standard. He's the one that makes the commands. He's the one that changes our lives. He's the one that saved our souls. He's the one that saved us from sin. He's the one that empowers us for living. He's the one that's granted us everything we need for life and godliness. He's the one that's blessed us with every heavenly blessing here on earth. He's the one that provides for us. He's the one that takes care of us. If this is true, then does it stand for the election? Yes. So, 
This leads us to the next point. If we're a people who honor, we are people who glorify God. Let me show you. Go back to 1 Peter. Go back to 1 Peter. The last verse. It says, honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. We glorify God when we honor a president we do not like. When we honor our leaders, our president, we show forth the truth that no matter who is president, that we trust a living God and he is still king and he's on the throne in heaven forever. In fact, it says in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1, it says, The king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. Now, that was talking about Solomon. Solomon was making a statement about himself. But actually, Solomon turned out to be a really terrible king. But he made a statement. But this, how does this apply to us today? What if, if Hillary, what if Donald, whoever gets in, how does this apply? It applies in this way. Let me show you. Turn with me to Psalm 96. Psalm 96. And we're going to come back to Proverbs 21.1 about the king's heart is like the channels of water. That the hand of the Lord, he turns it wherever he wishes. Look at Psalm 96, verse 7. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the, of, of, of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering, come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy attire. Tremble before him all the earth. First, we have to as, as, ascribe to the Lord the glory that's due his name. Why? Here's the truth. Look at verse 10. Worship the Lord in holy attire. Tremble before him, as verse 9. Look at verse 10. Say among the nations, the Lord, what? Reigns. Indeed the, whole, the, indeed, the world is firmly established and it will not be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Here's the point. God is going to judge. God is going to take care of it. It's his place. He's the boss. And we, by how we respond to what he is doing and what we may not understand, what we may think he's not doing, when we submit to what God wants in our lives and honor his word, he gets the glory. The truth is, is that God's still on the tr throne. And verse 11, look what it says, verse 11. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth do what? Rejoice. So when our candidate who we don't like wins on Tuesday, what do we do? We rejoice. That goes against everything, doesn't it? That makes you uncomfortable. Because if the one that I'm not voting for wins, there's going to be a little bit go, oh, man. Rejoice in the Lord always again. I say rejoice. <coughs> it didn't taste good. Okay? But let's, let's be, is that a reality? Yes. But we do it no matter how we feel. Last point. You're going, what about this Proverbs 21.1? How do we respond to that? Hang on to that thought. Here's the question. I got a question for you. Look what it says. Will we glorify or grieve God? This has been, in all honesty, the ugliest election that is, can ever be remembered in our lifetimes. It's ugly. It's very ugly. There are those claiming to be Christians. There's those claiming to persecute Christians. There's those that are just, you don't know what's going on. And it's ugly and it's nasty. But here's what Ephesians says in chapter 4, verse 30. It says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Turn with me to Ephesians. Let's look at it. And we only got one more scripture we're going to go to. So you're going, man, it's Bible Drill Sunday. Turn to Ephesians. Look at chapter 4. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit, verse 30, of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Grieve means to distress. How do we grieve him? Look at verse 31. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, 
Boy, that gets you right there, doesn't it? Clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. That's how we grieve him, by doing those things. That's how his heart is grieved. How do we glorify him? Look at verse 32. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. That's how we glorify him. That's how we respond. Turn with me to 1 Timothy, and then we're done. Back to Proverbs 21. If that scripture applies to Solomon, who started out good but ended pretty bad, how does that apply to us? What do we do with that? How do we say the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord like a water course? He can turn it whichever way he wants to. How do we do that? 1 Timothy, look at chapter 2. First of all, I urge that entreaties, prayers, and petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. For kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Let's keep going. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved, to come to the knowledge of truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all the testimony given at the proper time. For this, I was appointed a preacher. And he goes on, and, and, and Paul was talking about himself He was for this reason. But let me show you something. Look at what it says, that we are to pray. It says entreaties, prayers, and petitions. Very simple. Entreaties are what? Needs. What's the need of our country? To come back to God. What is the need of our country? To put a leader in there that God can use. What's the need of our country? To return in revival and in repentance to God. That's a need. So what do we do? We pray. We bring that need. That's the first thing. It says in prayers. Prayers meaning very simple. Prayers here is the word prosuke. It means prayers directed to God. It means prayers and devotion to God. We who are devoted to God, we who carry the name believer, we who carry the name Christian, are to pray, are to bring these needs before God in prayer. And when, our, when the, our new president steps in, whoever he or she may be, whoever gets in there, our job, our calling from God is to pray for them. Our calling from God is to intercede for them. That's what a Christian is supposed to do. You're saying we don't get out there and protest? You want my honest answer? Yes, we don't get out there and protest. I protested once for a, uh, for, uh, on a, uh, against an abortion clinic, and I've never done it again. Because as I stood there with a sign and going, do I believe abortion is wrong? Absolutely. That's why I said, vote according to the word of God. I'm against abortion for whatever reason. Hope no one leaves the church. But I stood out there with a sign one time in protest many, many years ago, and I watched how people reacted as they drove by. And it, I felt ashamed as I did it. And over the years, I haven't done it yet, but over the years I thought about what if we stood there and we just gave water or we, we blessed people, we prayed for them, even as they were walking in, even though we don't agree with that. What if we prayed for them and said, before you go in, let us pray for you. Not pray, Father, I pray that she doesn't sin today. If I ever heard somebody do that, I would lay hands on you. And you would fall under the power of somebody. Because that's not right. There's no guilt in this. But pray for them. So what do we do as believers? Do we protest? No. What do we do? We pray. What do we do? We stand and be different. We stand and say, I know that no matter what happens in this nation, God's going to be glorified because I'm praying. I'm doing what the Bible says. First of all, I urge you that entreaties, prayers, and then the last thing is petitions. What does petition mean? It means intercession. It means praying on behalf of someone else. I'm praying on behalf of our nation. 
We're praying on behalf of our leaders. We're praying for our, 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 our congressmen. We're praying for our governors. We're praying. Do I agree with everything that happens in, in, here in Atlanta? No. But I pray. So what do we do? We pray. God told Israel in exile, in Babylon, he said this to them in Jeremiah 29, 7, not 11. Seek and pray for the welfare of the city. He said, for 70 years you're going to live here. He said, take wives, start businesses, do what you need to do. But he said, pray for the welfare of the city. But because it's from the welfare of the city that your welfare is going to come from, is what he told them. And that meant to pray and to honor the king of Babylon, who had them in exile. Wow. So what do we do? How do we respond? The answer is we will glorify God and pray. That's what I'm asking us to do. This is not a, a I'm sure many others could have done a greater job in presenting this. But I will tell you this, but the thing that I'm not hearing too much is that we need to pray, and we need to get on our knees, and we need to pray for God to set a person in that he wants. When, when Clinton was put in as president, that was another election that many were praying that many didn't want to see Clinton get in. But I remember, and it was the same word was given when Obama came into office, first and second time. There was a man that I knew, his name was Bob Jones, a very prophetic man. And I heard him say that the president that we got when it came was Clinton and even Obama was better than America deserved. And that was shake of and he said he'd been praying about it, and God spoke that to him. The little bit I know of him, I believe that that was a word from the Lord. It was better than we deserved. The nation, I believe, the state of our union is because we as believers, and I don't get, this may sound like a guilt trip, but it's a call. It's a call. Our nation is swaying because the church is not doing its job on their knees in prayer. I'm sorry. I'll say it. And I'm convicting myself. Imagine if believers stood on the word of God and prayed. What would happen? I said earlier, and I'm going to close on this. When does a Christian ever disobey? When they're going to put us in prison or they command us to deny our faith. Our disobedience is saying, no, we will not. Our disobedience is not shown in anger and in fighting and in rebellion like we see today. It's just standing there on the word of God saying, I can't do that. The only time the church ever rebelled in that way was when they were being persecuted unto death and they said, we will not deny God. Until that moment, they submitted to the leadership of Rome or wherever they live. Look it up. Correct me if I'm wrong. You ready to pray? I'm going to ask you all to come up. I'm going to ask us if we will, in honor of God, let's stand if we can. We're going to pray for a moment. I'm just going to let Gerald play some music, some worship in the back, background. I want us to just pray. Stand there. If you're standing next to your wife, your husband, or a friend, turn to somebody and together pray for our nation. Let's intercede for just a couple of minutes. Just intercede. Begin to pray for our nation. Tuesday, things change, my friends. Let's pray. If we need to repent, if you need to say, God, forgive me because I slandered our president that's in office now, then repent. Repent of it. Ask God to save 
Barack Obama. Ask God to change his life, as many have been doing. Let's join with those prayers. Ask God to move our nation towards him. Repent for the sins of our nation. I believe prayer can move mountains. And I'm not just saying that. Begin to pray. Intercede. Let each other hear what you're praying if you can. If if you're comfortable with that. And if you're not comfortable with that, do it anyways. Let them hear so they can agree. We can't agree in prayer if we don't know what somebody's praying. Let our voices be lifted up to God. Just pray. Seek the Lord for a moment. We're, we're going to be out of here in a few minutes. Seek the Lord. Lift your voices to Him. Yes, God. God. Keep praying, saints. Keep praying. Yes, Lord. Pray for a nation. Pray. Pray. Lord, I come to you in Jesus' name. We come as a congregation, as a group of believers, part of your church. We come, Lord, in the freedom that you've given us. We come, Lord, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and I'm believing that, Lord, because you said you sealed us into the day of redemption. We have your presence in our lives. So therefore, Lord, we can come in authority and come in power, and we come in humility before your throne. And God, we lay our nation before you, And we say, Lord, change our nation. Draw us back to you, Lord. That we truly a nation saying, in God we trust. We want to trust in you again. So, Lord, I ask that you will move this way. And, Lord, as our election is coming up, as, Lord, these two candidates are laid before us, that, Father, whoever gets into office, Lord, whoever you move that way, Lord, we declare today that, Father, we will honor them in Jesus' name. We will stand and we will honor them and we will pray for them and we will bless them. We won't bless the things that are against you, but we will bless them, Lord. We will bless that position that they hold as president. We will honor that, Lord. But Father, we're asking in Jesus' name that, Lord, that you will move upon either one of their hearts, both of them, Lord, collectively. That, Father, for Hillary and for Donald, that, Lord, you move upon their hearts in such a way that they will honor you. Lord, let our nation honor you once again. And Lord, I pray for the church in this nation, that Lord, that you will raise up a people that begin to pray, and that no matter when the election, uh, what happens in the election, after the election, Lord, that we will continue to pray. That Father, we will ask that Lord, by your power, by your sovereignty, by everything that you are, and by your love, that you will draw the people to you, you will draw our nation to you, Lord. Lord, call us to prayer. Call the church to prayer. Wake us up to pray. Lord, do what you must. Lord, I believe that there's a shifting coming. Lord, I believe that you are about ready to do something. But Father, whatever that may be, that Lord, that you will will let us know and we will begin to pray and we will begin to seek your face over and we will begin to intercede for this. That Lord, you will turn our nation to you once again that America will be a nation under God. Lord, I pray that you will put the right person in, Lord. 
I pray the Father that you will put the right man or even woman in. That Father, your kingdom will come and your will will be done for our nation. And Lord, in Jesus' name, we repent of anything we have done that has dishonored our leaders. Grant us a humble heart, Lord. And like you said, it's our part to humble ourselves before you. So Lord, we humble ourselves the best we can this morning, the best we know how. And we say, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for any slander, any malice, anything we've held or said. Humble our hearts. Lord, we love you. And we ask you to save our nation, Lord. And may we have wisdom as we vote on Tuesday. May we use your word as our guideline. Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll give someone a hug. And we'll see you guys on Wednesday night.